I'm here to help you out with your electrodynamics course. I remember being an undergraduate and being very confused with the displacement field. So we're going to talk about the displacement field. Here's the order of things that we're going to cover. One, polarization. We need to talk about polarization. It's hugely important when we talk about the displacement field. Two, what's the difference? Two, what's the difference between free charges and bound charges? Three, what is the displacement field and how do we derive that? Gauss's law with the displacement field. And then finally, why? Why are we doing all this? So let's get started with polarization. We gotta do it. We gotta do everything. Racing the board so we can do it all. Here we go. So remember that you know, we had this very, very basic model of a, a single element, let's say a, a proton surrounded by uh, an electron cloud. And then I put another charge over there. This is going to polarize, right? So we'll actually get something like this. It looks like a minus and a positive, And it creates, even though it's a neutral atom, it still creates an electric field. And that's going to matter. So now if I put this near here, it's not just that this creates an electric field over here. Now I have this situation where over here, the electric field is due to the sum of all these things. I have to include them all. One way we can deal with this is with the dipole moment, P. So in this case, P would be Q times D, where this is the D vector right there. Uh, so that's the dipole moment for a single dipole. That's the electric dipole moment, lowercase p. Now imagine that I have the same thing, but I have a big block of material. It's an insulating material, so the charges can't move, but I put a charge right there, and I'm going to get a whole bunch of polarization from all the atoms. So they're all going to uh, polarize in the same kind of way, uh, you know, this way, but they may not be the same value. So they may point in different directions, and that's a terrible picture right there. But those are all my dipole moments. They have all have dipole moments. How can I describe the changes in the dipole moment over the whole thing? This is where we get the polarization. Polar, I'm going to write it out. Polarization. Polarization. Got it. And it's capital P. So I put an underline under there. And this is just the dipole moment per unit volume. So if I take uh, the dipole moment at any particular place, the average dipole moment, I divide by the volume of that element, I get the polarization. Another way to put that is if I know the polarization as a function of volume, I could calculate the dipole moment for the whole thing. So the dipole moment P would just be the integral over the volume of the polarization uh, times the volume element. So you can go either way. But the polarization is one way to treat you know, how that whole object is polarized, whereas each individual dipole moment may be different. Okay, so that's, that's polarization. Now, why does it matter? We're going to get into that. But the important thing is that this is still a neutral object. I put a charge there. It's going to get polarized, and now those little dipole moments will affect other things around it. So it's a complicated situation, and this is why we need the dipole, the displacement field. Now let's think about free versus bound charges. So imagine that I have a big picture like this. I'm going to draw the charges. So I have a positive charge over there again, and so I'm going to get a dipole moment, 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 and then one more set, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus, minus. So these are what we call bound charges. They're, they're stuck in their basic location. They can't just go wherever they want. So we're going to call those. Uh, but it's not 0, right? If I move across here, I'm going to go positive, negative, positive, negative. The overall, the overall charge of the cube is 0, but the charge in C is not 0. Now, the other thing that we can get is I know I have a polarization here right, because it's polarized this way. It's constant mostly in this case. And so over on this side, I'm going to get an excess positive charge because there's nothing connect, there's no, nothing canceling those, whereas right here those cancel, those cancel. And so I'm going to get effectively negatives and positives over there. So we'll get surface charge. This is bound surface charge sigma b. There is a relationship between the bound surface charge and the polarization. So this says that the polarization 
dot n hat is sigma b. I made a video on this, but basically the idea is uh, if you have a polarization at the surface, it's going to cause charge on the surface because you have these leftover ends on the two sides. What about in the middle? Well, we have the following. The divergence of the polarization, del dot p, is equal to negative the charge in c. Is that right? Is it the negative charge in c or the charge in c divided by epsilon naught? No, that's it. Okay. So what does this mean? Imagine that I had some polarization that looked like this. That would be just like a bunch of these dipole moments up here, except backwards. And there's no free charges in there. There's no extra charges in there. So the, the charge density would be zero. Is this free density or? No, that's the bound charge density. The bound charge density is zero. Now imagine another situation. Suppose I'm able to contrive a situation that looks like this. So my polarization is not uniform. This polarization is uniform and the divergence of this is zero. So this is del dot p equals zero, right? If, if the fields don't diverge at all or converge, then the divergence is zero. So what if I have a situation like this? It's clearly not zero. So del dot p is greater than zero. It's going away. Well, if we replace those polarization vectors with charges, I have plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus, plus minus. And so over here, since all those minuses point in towards each other, I do have a charge density. So the charge density at that point would be a negative charge. It's the opposite direction of this. So we can see plausibly that the divergence of the polarization is negative the charge density. So that's important. OK. So we have bound surface charge, bound surface charge density. These two are important. Surface charge density, charge density, volume charge density. But what about free charges? What's the difference between a bound and a free charge? Let's put up another situation. Suppose I have a block of insulating material and I put a charge in there. I place that charge. It doesn't have a negative charge to go with it. So it's an actual charge. Induced charges are actual charges too. And so that's going to cause this, oops, sorry, this polarization in the material like that. And if we think about it like we have pluses and minuses, these are all actual charges that are separated, right? So here we have two types of charges. We have free charge, the charge, free charge density, and then these are bound charge densities because they're there because of the elect applied electric field, which happens to be due to this charge right there. If you take that away, that bound charge density goes to zero. No applied electric field, no polarization. Has, well, you can have frozen polarization like an electric material. Uh, that's a little bit different. But let's just imagine it's a normal material. So that's bound versus free. And what does it have to do with the displacement field? So let's go back to um, Gauss's law. So you remember Gauss's law look, looks like this. It's the divergence of the electric field is the density, charge density over epsilon naught. That's Gauss's law. Well, we have two kinds of charge. We have bound and free charge. So let's put in free charge plus bound charge over epsilon naught. Now I can go up here and say, well, the bound charge is negative the divergence of the polarization. So with that, I get del dot E, the divergence of the electric field, is equal to the free charge over epsilon naught minus the divergence of the polarization over epsilon naught. Let's add this, let's multiply both sides by uh, epsilon naught. So if I do that, I get, I'm gonna, I'm, I feel like this diagram's kind of like getting in my way. It's, it's messing up my mojo. So if I multiply both sides by epsilon naught, I get epsilon naught del dot E equals, uh, this is free. 
I get row free minus del dot the polarization. This is a derivative and this is a constant. I can actually bring that constant into the derivative. So I can write this as the divergence of epsilon naught e rho free minus the divergence of the polarization. Now let's add this term to the other side and I get the divergence of epsilon naught e plus the divergence of the polarization is equal to the free charge. This derivative, I can actually, un this is the product rule, right? So I can just go backwards and pull the derivative out. out. Well, notice the chain, well, no, it'd be the, I don't have to do that, right? They're both, it's a sum. So I can just factor that out. And I can say the divergence of epsilon naught e plus, that's a p, plus p is equal to the free charge. Now we define D as the displacement field as epsilon naught E plus P. And that's the displacement field D. It's not the same as the electric field. It doesn't even have the same units as electric field, right? Because electric field times epsilon naught gives you the displacement field. It's the same units as the polarization. Now, but if we put this back together, we can see really this important thing that del, the divergence of the displacement is the free charge. And so that kind of looks like, uh, our, it is our, it's, this is Gauss's law. It's still Gauss's law. But what's different about it? Well, what's different is that this is Gauss's law with reactive matter, right? So we can calculate the displacement field much easier than we can calculate the electric field. Going back over here, imagine I have a block. I put a charge right there. What's the electric field? Well, I don't really know, right? I have free charge, but that free charge influences this, and then this makes a new electric field. If I do the displacement field, it takes into account the polarization of this material into the displacement field. So I don't really need to know about that. I just need to know about the free charges. And then I can work backwards and find the electric field after that if I need to. So it, it kind of says, let's calculate a field that includes both the free charges and the bound charges together in that displacement field. And that's what it is. Um, you know, we can rewrite, we can use uh, Gauss's law here and turn this back into a, uh, an integral. So that looks like this. I don't know why I have to, so the, if we integrate del dot d dv, that's going to be equal to, just like in Gauss's law, for the other one, the surface integral of, what am I going to say? d dA, that's over the surface, and that's the total charge, that's the free charge enclosed. Not over epsilon naught, that epsilon naught's already involved, included in that d. Okay. That's a lot. I want to point out that Gauss's law still works, right? You don't need the displacement field. It's just an easier tool to solve for things. And that's the displacement field. You're not really going to understand it until it works in problems. So we're going to have to work some problems, but that'll be another video. Talk to you later.